So Father, I thank you uh, for this blessing to come together with our family here up at uh, Gabriel Fellowship Church, to be together as one in, in you. Um, Lord, thank you for the openness here. And I pray, Lord, that you just anoint your words through me that would touch our hearts, open up deeper understandings, deeper truths, and really bring us further along this process of freedom in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we've just turned the uh, calendar year, and one thing I found that when the calendar changes, everyone decides they're going to do something different. They decide they're going to make all sorts of resolutions. They're not going to eat so much. They're going to uh, exercise more. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. And they give all these New Year's resolutions. And uh, where Elaine and I live, we're on a hill, and I noticed that first few days after New Year, there's a bunch of people jogging along. About three days later, there's a lot less. <laughs> About two weeks later, there's no one. <laughs> so it's all gone back to uh, where it was when they, when they started to make those resolutions. Because sadly, we realize in our humanity, despite our best intentions, and despite our desire to will ourselves to change, we drift back into the old habits. We just, um, it's like the default position. We keep going back to them. And there always seems to be something that is blocking our ability to change. We seem to be bound by some sort of invisible chain to the old pattern of brokenness or uh, something there. And, you know, it, even though we have good intentions and we don't really want to do it, we seem to keep drifting back. And so it is with our obedience to the Lord. We want to serve the Lord, and we want to do the right thing, and we want to please Him, but we seem to drift back into old patterns of sticking thinking and behavior that just isn't right. And uh, basically, it's we realize, okay, we, we have the reality of the cross. We've had this incredible forgiveness. We've had this amazing grace that He's given us, but still we drift back. Well, I can tell you we're in good company because the Apostle Paul said the same thing. He says, I don't understand what I do, but what I want to do, I don't do, and but what I hate, I do. You'll find that in Romans 7. So basically, he was struggling with the same thing. Because, you know, the Lord told us, okay, we're new creations in Christ. You'll find that in 2 Corinthians 5. Anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And we have this amazing grace, the forgiveness of the cross, and a new identity. But we have a hard time accepting that new identity. We have a, new, a hard time accepting the freedom of the grace that what God has given us. And basically, there are things that then are blocking us becoming what we already are in Christ. Because the cross has completed it. But we are on a process of accepting it. And, you know, basically, Jesus said, I came to set you free. In John's Gospel, John 8, if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. And he knows, Jesus knows, that humanly, we are incapable of keeping our own rules. We just can't do it, far less his rules. We just have a hard time. There's something about our behavior. But the good news is that he has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen? He's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit to empower us from the inside out so that we can change. We can be different. And he can cut through these invisible chains and these bondages and break that uh, hold that's been there, that prison. And it tells us very clearly in 2 Corinthians 3, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness from one degree of glory to another, uh, and with, comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So the Lord's saying us, I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit, when you accept me and I'm going to change you 
with your permission, from one degree of glory into another, until eventually you will reflect the Lord's glory. You'll be like Jesus. So there's a pathway that we're going to go through that step by step, the Holy Spirit's going to transform us and change our way of thinking and stay, change our way of behaving until we come into the fullness of his glory. And it's a beautiful description. And when I prayed about what the Lord wanted me to share with you up in Gabriola, I said, Lord, what, what, what would you like me to share? And I felt that he wanted me to share about these invisible chains that keep us from being tied to these old patterns. First, uh, today, about uh, broken behavior patterns and next Sunday, how we get tied to people, which may seem strange, but you'd be surprised how many, perhaps even here, are still trying to obey a command from a teacher or a parent, and we're stuck in a rut and kept going. So Jesus wants to cut through these invisible chains, and I pray that as we share today, that you'll get a, a revelation yourself from the Holy Spirit and get an understanding in your heart that you are still entangled in a web that's holding you back. Now, I remember hearing a, a really interesting talk by Caroline Leaf. I don't know if you've ever listened to her. She's a neurophysiologist, a wonderful Christian sister. And she said, these patterns of thinking, she said, you've got to think of a ski person going down a slope on the snow. And the first time they go down, they barely make an impression on the snow. But if they go down the same pathway again, it gets a little bit deeper. And if they go down it a third time, it gets a little deeper. And as they keep going down that same pathway, what happens, a little channel gets formed and eventually a rut. And you know what happens is it's much easier to go down the rut than it is on a different pathway. And she said that's the way of our behavior because we get into a pattern of behavior and we tend to keep going down the same way. And we start acting and reacting in the very same way. And sadly, when we're hurt, generally we don't act very godly, amen? We don't seem to do things the Lord's way. You know, if we get cut off on the car, do we say, oh, bless you? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, that guy. <laughs> but anyway, so what happens is there's something happens. And I wanted to share with you a testimony I heard of a fella in Toronto. Elaine and I went back there, the Toronto Blessings, see what the Lord was blessing there. And this fella gave this testimony, and he said, I've been here three days. And he says, I've watched all the exuberant praise. I've seen people raise their hands, get slain in the spirit, get prophetic words, the worship, you know, they're jumping up and down and some are falling on the floor and that. And he says, I'm dry as a bone. He said, I thought it was all nuts. He said, I thought they'd lost their noodle. You know, they're doing all these goofy things. And he said, and he said, I just came, I don't know why I came back, but he said, I was just at the end of my rope. He said, I needed something. And he said, I was here three days and nothing has happened. I said, I was just about to go home. And he suddenly, he said, in a flash, the Holy Spirit just descended on him and took him to the time he was 12 years old, standing at his house. And his daddy, who he loved, died. And he said, I was taken right back to that spot in a memory. And I, I love my dad. We did all sorts of things together. And he said, he died. And he said, I, I was really broken hearted. And he said, I was so angry at God for killing my dad. He said, I, I just became, from that time, he said, I got angry. And he said, as I carried on through life, I got bitter and angry. I had no use for anything. I just carried on the same way. And he said, life became dry. And he said, what happened in a flash? He said, when God took me to that memory, he said, I looked up and I saw my daddy with Jesus. And he was smiling. And he said, I realized. 
he hadn't killed my dad, he'd saved him. And he said all the bitterness and all the anger and all the rage, the invisible chains were broken. And the love of God poured into him. And he said, I'm a new man. He was sort of like Scrooge on Sunday mor- uh, Christmas Day morning. I'm a new man. I can't believe I'm so happy. And he stood before all the people there and gave that very personal testimony. See, that's what God wants to do. He wants to set us free from the chains that keep us. And generally, how they form sometimes occurs very early in life. And we react to that hurt. Maybe it was abuse as a child. Or maybe it was an unkind word from a parent. Or perhaps from a teacher. Or perhaps in the church. And bit by bit it set up a reaction in your heart that put you in chains. And as time went on, you tend to react the same way again. You can't seem to break through of that behavior. In fact, uh, for a lot of us, we forget even where it did start, and sometimes we say, well, that's the way I am. But it's not the way God made you. God wants you to be free. Because when that happens, you get in prison. You're actually imprisoned, and the Lord puts it in his word like a dungeon. Like this Psalm 107. Some sat in darkness and deepest gloom, prisoners suffering in iron chains, for they had rebelled against the words of God and had despised the counsel of the Most High. It's a thought prison. It's a place that it holds you. And uh, basically, if that's not bad enough, there's an enemy that torments you in that place. And I want to share with you this incredible allegory that was written a long time ago with a guy named John Bunyan called Pilgrim's Progress. I don't know if some of you have read it. It's well worth reading. But it's a story really about Christian going to the celestial city and all the different things he finds on the way to the city. And I want to share with you this one passage because as they're going along this path to the glory, to the celestial city, they decide that the way they're on, the way of the Lord, is perhaps not the easiest. So they go over a little stile and they go into this meadow and they get lost and they fall asleep. And now what happens, they haven't realized they've wandered into the grounds of Doubtful Castle. And in their grounds of Doubtful Castle, there's a giant there called Giant Despair. So when they wake up, Giant Despair comes and catches them in the grounds. And he takes them prisoner. And Giant Despair then takes them and puts them in his dungeon. It says this, um, that basically, oh, by the way, there, he had a partner It was called Hopeful. The giant therefore drove them before him and put them into his castle into a very dark dungeon, nasty and stinking to the spirits of these two men. And he doesn't feed them, and yet they have no water, and they have no food. And after three or four days, he finally comes into the dungeon, but instead of giving them some comfort, he starts to beat them with a stick. He falls upon them and beats them fearfully in such sort that they are not able to help themselves or turn upon the floor. And this done, he withdraws and leaves them there to console their misery and to mourn under their distress. And they get so beat up in prison that even Christian says, the life that we now live is miserable. For my part, I know not whether it's best to live thus or die out of hand. My soul chooses strangling rather than life and the grave is more easy for me than the dungeon. But that's just what can happen in life because a giant of fear, of um, intimidation, of rejection can put you in a prison and you begin to have be tormented by the enemy. And it's an allegory of the torment of the enemy because If you're trapped, you're going to be tormented in that place of brokenness. And the enemy will continue to come in. 
and accuse you. What kind of Christian are you? Remember when you did this. I remember uh, hearing uh, another testimony of a man um, by the name of Mike, and he said he used to drive by this hamburger place, and every time he drove by it, he'd feel real bad. And the reason was, he said, when I was growing up, we were very poor. We couldn't afford shoes, and we didn't have any money at all. And the friends at school would go in to get a hamburger. But he said, I couldn't go because I couldn't afford it. And I'd always make an excuse. And so from that fear of poverty, he got put in a dungeon. And the shame, every time, even though now he had plenty of money, he had plenty of things to do, every time he drove by, the enemy would remind him of the shame of the poverty. And that's what the enemy does. He reminds you of the things that happened in the past. And like the situation with Christian and hopeful, you get into a place perhaps where the fear and and hurt go to deeper depressions. And you feel maybe you should take your own life. But I got good news. I got very good news. Because although we can't break the chains in our willpower, God will break the chains for us. Amen? He is there to set us the captives free. That's exactly what he says. He says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We got the authority of Jesus to break through the chains. Amen? To set the captives free. And this is what he told us through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 45. I'll go before you and I'll level the mountains. I'll break through the gates of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. There's no place that the enemy has tried to put you that I won't set you free. You're going to be set free. And that's exactly the ministry of the Lord because the Lord said to the synagogue in Nazareth in Luke 4, he was proclaiming from the prophet Isaiah. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to bring release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And that is the freedom of the Lord, amen? And each of you here who proclaim the name of Jesus are anointed by the Holy Spirit. And so the anointing of the Lord is upon you to preach good news to the poor to bring release to the captives, to set at liberty those that are oppressed. It doesn't depend on one person. It depends on the Lord. Amen? He's anointed us to be and move out in his authority to set the captives free. And this is basically what the Lord wants us to do. Now, coming back to Pilgrim's Progress, I don't want to leave those guys in the dungeon. Neither did the Lord. So what happens in the dungeon is this. Christian suddenly comes to his senses and he says, What a fool I am to lie in this stinking dungeon when I may as well walk at liberty. I have a key in my bosom called promise that I am persuaded will open any lock in Doubting Castle. And so uh, what happened? Christian pulls it out of his bosom, begins to try it at the dungeon door whose lock, as soon as he turns the key, gives back and the door flies open, and Christian and Hopeful walk out in the sunshine. Amen? But that's true for you and I. We don't have to languish in a place that we're trapped by behavior or our thinking or our emotions. And the promise is all the words of truth that Jesus Christ gave us. Because as he says, 2 Corinthians 1, 20, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken to us, to the glory of God. Isn't that beautiful? All the promises of God. Just think of all the promises in the book. I didn't choose you, or you didn't choose me. I chose you. You're the top and not the bottom. Your enemy is going to come in one direction and flee in seven. You're a new creation. You're seated in the heavenly places. 
you're my person, I love you, you're my servant, and on and on. Every promise of God is true for you. So why should we be in despair or in dungeons, amen? We don't have to languish with that type of stinking thinking and trapped with that behavior. Even though people will try to put us down, they can't do it because we have the power of God inside of us. We have the power of God right here. And this is what the Lord says. Suppose you're in a place of fear. Perhaps it was like uh, that fellow, you know, uh, with the hamburgers, fear of poverty. And many are trapped by a fear of poverty. I know my folks came through the Depression, as yours did, or maybe two generations back, and uh, they had a fear of poverty. And uh, I know I still got a bit of that because Elaine tells me, keep clearing out the basement. But uh, I keep everything. <laughs> but anyway, fear of poverty can trap you and you um, get uneasy. But basically, the um, lock, the key to that prison is Second Timothy 1, for God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and sound mind. And so you can apply that truth to that lock. So any place you find yourself trapped in, you can use the word of God as the truth, the promise to set you free. And you can walk out. And basically, these chains get cut, these bondages, because you no longer are bound to that broken behavior. You're no longer bound to that way of thinking. You're no longer bound. And so you can walk in freedom without the torment continually coming back. Because as long as you languish in prison, you'll get the torment. And, and when I say torment, what it is, the enemy is there to accuse you of what a bum you are. And he keeps accusing you. But the reality is that you can counter that accusation by the truth. And that's basically exactly what the Lord said. Coming back to that beautiful Psalm 107. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the deepest gloom, and he broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. And I pray today you just get a, a reality of that love of God, how much he loves you, how much. They say that after the Civil War, many of the slaves continued working on the plantation, not realizing they were free. And that's true for many of us in Christ. We continue stuck, not realizing we're free. The door is open and we don't have to be there. And I really pray that you let the Lord give you a revelation of that. I thought I'd uh, just lead you in a prayer. Just give you some time to reflect on something that you realize, I am stuck in that one area of uh, thought. It might be fear, it might be rejection. It might be something else. So let the Lord show you. And then I'm just going to pray. And, you, you know, because the, the way is to proclaim the truth that's confessing the lie, telling the Lord you're sorry. And then I'll uh, use the sword of the Spirit, a word of God, to break through the chains. And you'd be released in Jesus' name. And that'll allow you to walk in freedom. And the Holy Spirit like uh, Mary Charlotte was saying, it's the Holy Spirit who gives the revelation. We can't. Elaine and I can't. It doesn't come from your head, deductive reasoning. It comes from the Lord himself. And if you wait on the Lord, he'll give you a picture or a memory of where that blockage came from. And once that revelation is there for you, then you can take that to the cross, okay? Okay. He's the one that did, but he won't go against your will. He won't take you where you're not ready to go. Neither will we. But he'll take you into freedom if you want to go. So I pray that you just let, really, let's have a quiet time. Just reflect on the Holy Spirit, on the Lord Jesus. 
however you feel that. Just let yourself quiet and just you tell the Lord to reveal to you if you're trapped somewhere. So Lord, I pray now your anointing will go out across each of us, Lord. And give us a revelation of where we've been stuck and continually repeating the same old pattern where we're bound. Show us, Lord, where we're bound. It might be a memory is coming back or something that's coming to you. And we're just going to take that to the cross now. And the first thing is to put to death the lie and tell the Lord you're sorry for having believed and done that, um, that lie. So, Lord, we confess before you that that was wrong, and we're sorry. We're sorry, Lord. We confess it as a sin. And we lay it down at your cross. And now we take God's, your mighty word, your word that says, is not my word like fire, like a rock, like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. And we shatter and break the chains that have tied us to that guilt, that shame, that embarrassment. And Lord, we choose now to walk into freedom in your name. Amen. Bless you. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And the enemy knows he just wants to keep us down. Amen. But we're a mighty army. We have a lot of power in the Lord. This is a broken world, as we see, it's getting broken worse and worse every day. But the Lord's raised us up to bring the hope and the healing to the nations. This is what he's raised us up for, to go forth and tell the good news and to set the captives free, to make those that are blind and ignorant the truth about the Lord and the gospel. This is our time the time that Jesus has raised up his people to speak hope and faith and expectation. We're in a time where everyone seems to be in a dungeon of despair, getting beat up by a giant. You don't have to trip on the internet very much to see every sort of ridiculous statement. But now is not the time to be in that area. Now is the time to be with the Lord in the heavenlies and to walk forth and bring the hope and the salvation to the people. You know, that's what the Lord said in the latter days. He said, the, the love of many will go cold. But he said, when those days come, you look up, because your redemption draweth nigh. And that's a great promise.